So third wave theory, well, basic argument which myself and Michael Hope made is that indeed it's very difficult to capture politeness and impoliteness on the macro level. Because they come into existence through evaluation situated in multiple layers of understanding. It's like, for example, if you talk about Hindi politeness, I, I would have an ethic and outsider understanding, foreigners understanding, if any understanding. I have the culture insiders understanding, so it's quite difficult for us to be on the same page regarding uh, this linguistic phenomenon. However, it is not impossible again. And if we can't say things about different languages, then just, we can just close the shop window and don't do politeness research. So what I'm going to discuss today is um, in this lecture is previous research on politeness. And then in the following lecture, I'm going to, to discuss what we should do in my view. So the main, main ideas of previous research. Um, so I will overview the history of impoliteness research, discussing my terms, etc. Et no? Yeah, so well, as you all know, I don't I won't say anything new. First wave approaches are centered on Rice's idea of cooperative principle, which is built up by conversational maxims, quality, quantity, relevance, and manner. The basic idea is that we always, if we want to be polite, we unavoidably flout one or several of these maxims. Like, for example, somebody's uh, pet, somebody's cat uh, passes away. If I come to you saying that your cat is dead, you will consider me being very rude. So instead I would try to follow a more circumspectual kind of more indirect approach. For example, by saying that, oh, I'm very sorry to you being the bearer of bad news, but I have really bad, bad news about your cat, so you will sit by your car. In this case, I will, actually I will float the maxim of quantity, because the maxim says, or the maxims tell people how to communicate in a more, most efficient way. And obviously here, I will, be, I will say more than what is needed. I will give much more information than what is needed. However, I will be able to assume that my speech partner will know that I'm doing this because both of us agree that it's a nice thing to be indirect in such a situation. So he will understand that I understand, that he understands, that I understand that this is the flouting of the maximum quantity, basically. It's quite easy. Well, I have this favorite example from, do you know The Simpsons? It's an American cartoon. Absolute fun, absolute fun. And in one of the scenes, it was in, in my book, I really love this one, uh, Homer, who is the protagonist, a very fat, stupid guy, talks to his dad, and the dad is angry of him. So Homer says, I can't tell you how sorry I'm dad. And the grandpa says, is someone talking to me? I didn't hear anything. And then Homer says, oh no, that's not his hearing. And he runs out of the room looking for doctors. But obviously what's going on here is that dad, your grandpa, wants to say that he's angry, so I'm not, I won't talk to you. But and this is, of course, not true. He flouts the maxim of, of, of quality. He's not saying what is, what is true. However, Homer takes this as true, so another word, communication is not working, right? So when the float thing of a maxim takes place, everyone is supposed to know that this is some, this is what it is. Uh, well, it is the same for indirect. Anyway, I, switch, I skip this one, it's not interesting. Um, yeah, so the most important of this series is the one I already mentioned, Penelope Brown and Stephen Levinson. This was actually published in a short form in 1978, so much, much before everyone's time in this room. And then a revised book format was published in 1987. It's an amazingly good series again, so I have nothing wrong with it. It's dated, so you would use, in any, I mean, if you go to physics or computer, for example, in computer, you wouldn't really use series or, or articles or books that you don't really have books in computer, but you would use articles always which were written in the 1980s, right? The things have moved on. It's quite strange in politeness that people criticize Bernard Levinson, but for heaven's sake, it's an old theory written nearly 30 years ago. So what do you want from it? Why do you criticize it all the time? But other people just use it without any 
sort of thinking. It's again quite strange to me because it was written again 30 years ago. It's good like to, to use it at least uncritically. Now let me have a look at the basic idea, ideas in Brown and Levinson and Geoffrey Leach, Geoffrey Leach and Robin Lakoff, so those who have written uh, early series of politeness. And again, these are often criticized quite unjustly, these are just I think the old feedback. So all these people, the students of Noam Chomsky, you can see him on the right, up in the right corner. Uh, in Chomsky's framework and in generative linguistics in general, there is this idea of universality. So everything has to be universal. If you can't describe things in a universal way, there's no reason to do research, linguistic research. And this is why I believe that these scholars have adopted this notion of universality and they aimed towards creating these frameworks of universal ones. Now, I think the misunderstanding, the main misunderstanding comes from here. Instead of studying things on a universal level, they should have focused on the macro level, without claiming universality. If they had done that, there would have been no problem, no such a large amount of criticism. And in a sense, what we need to do is to go general, broad level, macro level, without claiming universality. Ritesh and myself had this conversation yesterday that we need to be able to say things about Hindi, for example, in order to get the software, or to opera operationalize the software. You can do this, but you need to be aware, of course, that you can't use just the same software without modifications and data input for other languages. Because you can, language phenomena like threats, politeness, aggression, and so on, are not universal. Can't, they can't be universal. For example, the role of silence is different across cultures. Even the role of time is different across cultures. Like, for example, I found in India that people like to, I mean, at least when they switch to English, they like to talk relatively slowly in a time-taking way. Like, for example, if you go to America, they will talk fast, right? It's quite different. Now, this makes, it makes it quite difficult to apply the same software without proper data input to both. Languages. So again, the emphasis is on macro level, not universality. Another idea that binds these early series together is the idea of face and rationality. So people behave in a rational way, which is again a Chomsky idea, the modern speaker. I think it's rubbish. I often behave in an unrational way, like for example, when I drink a bit, so I often say stupid things, and I might still be polite, but not necessarily in a rational way. Also, we are often in an autopilot mode. This is what I found. So my wife asks me, why have you said what you have just said? And I say, heaven knows, I just said it. So you know, it's not extremely rational. Although it's not unrational either. It's just, we should be engaged in, or describe everything in this mean sense way. Also, all of these people agree that politeness can be divided into negative and positive politeness. And Facebook, approach to negative and positive politeness, well, it's a question, we will talk about this. Because politeness and impoliteness may or may not be clearly positive and or, or, or negative. Like for example, from a culture insider's perspective, something might be positive, which may sound negative from the culture outsider's perspective. So it's not, not, and these are not notions which you can easily use if you want to go at your level. So yeah, um, after this series have been published, quite a few scholars, especially uh, Chinese and Japanese ones, noted that you know there are culture-specific factors behind politeness behavior. Like you might have read such a good work on discernment and volition. It's a paper which criticizes Brown and Levinson, and which has been criticized later quite heavily. Basically, it says that in Japanese you can't freely choose language forms. You can't necessarily use them in a main sense way. Like for example, if you want to say that my teacher, my professor, read something and you need to go honorific, you can't say the first sentence and say Bakureo Yonda, but instead you need to use honorific sentence Bakureo Yonda. It's the same in Hindi, I believe, lots of honorifics. And you can't ignore these to some in certain context. Actually, this is quite a stupid argument, I 
mind, mind you, because um, it's very difficult to, to prove that somebody doesn't use language in a, in a conscious way in such a situation. On the other hand, the argument may still make, nevertheless make sense, because it showcases, at least, that this, it's not always the same kind of strategic form of behavior taking place than what Brown and Levinson were talking about. <clears throat> In Brown and Levinson, people study forms and strategies, uh, strategies as the basic unit of analysis. In terms of form research, uh, Brown and Levinson were not very much interested in, 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 in forms, but rather really focused on strategies. Some other scholars, like those engaged in the research of forms of address, conducted in-depth research on, on, on forms. A basic problem with this, which was picked up in second wave politeness research, is that politeness is very difficult to capture on the level of words and utterances, because everything is embedded. This is what we discussed yesterday regarding the software. I would say that you can't study uh, utterances, but you need to study them within the broader context. So for example, when it comes to our machine and program, we need to talk about higher level and lower level annotation. Uh, Talika suggested yesterday, right? Also, in terms of methodology, well, the problem with, with the utterance level analysis is that it's easy to make claims, like Brand Levinson has this very lovely example that I had a flat tire on the way home. Oh God, a flat tire! This is, of, they, they claim that it's a typical positive face strategy, so you would want to say this in order to show compassion, sort of affiliate oneself with the person in, in the trouble. The problem is that you can't tear these out of context. Like for example, if there is a guy who is big and he's macho and supposed to be able to change tires, he might say, I had a flat tire on the way home and the other says, oh god, a flat tire. It might be quite, quite unnice as well. So you just can't break down things to the utterance level. Also you can't Elicit, elicit data. You can try, but there are some problems with elicit data, like, like for example, discourse completion tests. They used to be very popular in language education, and in journals, we still receive quite a lot of papers which do data eliciting. And this, these, are, these are the papers which are kicked out immediately. So, if any of you is thinking to publish stuff in journals, never to try with elicit data, unless, unless. You have a very special reason to do this, but you need to make a very good argument why you are using LCD data. Uh, yeah. So this is what I call as first wave approaches. As we could see, there are quite a few arguments which are pertinent to our present project, although I believe that in, in our project, it's it's Ritesh, Akin, and Yogo and others, we are talking, need to talk about aggression rather than impolite. So impoliteness is a misleading concept. But it's still important to talk about politeness and impoliteness because still what we do on aggression is based on politeness and impoliteness research. And concepts of politeness and impoliteness come up in, in, in this project all the time. So you can't get rid of them. Right? So again, this is the framework Gino Elen, which started this whole lot. So it was I don't know why, I mean, oh, I know, I used this slide once for the Chinese, uh, but okay, so, uh, skip this one. So, um, a few ideas in second order research which are useful, although they should be handled with care. Like, for example, variability and contestedness. When I was a PhD student, everybody was talking about, uh, about this claim that you just can't say anything about what I guess, because it's always subject to contestations people debate about it. And this person researchers went very far with this argument. And I think that that's correct to some extent. There is what they call in the English as idiosyncratic behavior. Idiosyncratic behavior is important, but only to some extent. Because in 99% of cases, we do agree about, about things. Of course, there's this 1% say, and we debate about politeness. We disagree, we offend each other unknowingly. But that's it. For God's sake, that's a, that's a, that's a minority of cases. And yes, researchers may not want to pursue research only in variability and contestedness. However, it is useful to bear these concepts in mind 
because it nevertheless exists. There's always a, an error factor, right? For example, if you want to, to prevent crime by, or by detecting aggression, you need to be aware of the fact that idiosyncratic behavior looms on the horizon. It's always there to some extent. Also, in these second order frameworks, uh, people started to reconsider their units of analysis. Like many people started to talk about communities of practice, which means that it replaces people and other sort of daily venues of, of in which people interact. People build up local communities, and according to many second day researchers, this local unit is more useful to conduct analysis than the culture and society. My main problem with the community of practice is that I read Etienne Wenger's book and I found it interesting, but I wouldn't be able to use it on my data. So for example, when we study threats on a bus, it's not necessarily the case that these people know each other. It's very like the case that one of the persons attacks the other. So I would say that we really need to be careful about our unit of analysis and to keep culture in mind. Because irrespective of whether it's a first, first it's one off meeting, or it takes place in a community of practice or in other settings, we are still being heavily influenced by culture. It can't be denied. So anybody who denies the existence of culture might have never been abroad because you know, culture is just there. Another idea in second wave research, which I take actually, I, I buy this one, is that faith and politeness are different things. Are different things. In order to show an example, I read a conversation from my book with Michael Ho. We studied a series, Everybody Hates Chris. He's an uh, Afro-American person, I think in New York. And he talks with his, his, his parents, Julius and Michelle. So he's saying, but can I please wear something else? She's saying, as long as I don't have to pay for it. Mother says, just find something to wear and I will take a look at it, okay? I don't have anything special, says Chris. When I was a kid, we didn't need any special clothes. Just having clothes was special. And then the narrator says, the only way I was going to get my mom to spend money on me was if not doing it would embarrass her. Uh -huh. Mom, I'm the only black kid in the whole school. They already think I'm a crack baby. Wearing this sweater, they will probably think we are on welfare. Who says we were on welfare, says mom. Be home from school on time. We are going tomorrow. We are going, going to go shopping. And so on and so on. What's going on here? Well, Chris makes an appeal to the family's face, right? They're going to lose face if you don't buy new clothes to me. Is this related to politeness? No, nothing, you know, it's not a polite or impolite interaction. It's heavily centered around face. Now, luckily, this face issue can be kept out of our project because I don't think that face, I mean, threat is something heavier than face threat. So we are not interested in face in this project. And it's need to be aware that if people you know, ask where is face, we can just say that no, we are studying polite uh, aggression by using a politeness and impoliteness model. Because face is not necessarily part of the politeness and impoliteness game. Like my friend Michael Ho has edited a whole complete volume. And he told to all the editors, uh, all the authors, I say not to use the word politeness. There's a complete work, complete book on on face with no mention of politeness and impoliteness, I think. Also, uh, well, um, in second wave series, they have extreme interest in naturally occurring interactions, which is not surprising, considering that people pursue interest in idiosyncratic behavior. So Elaine, for example, argued that we need to examine more examples of actual impoliteness evaluations. But due to the situational embeddedness, and argumentativity of politeness. Okay? They would have to derive from natural settings that occur spontaneously, and so on and so on. So it basically there is this idea that anything which we study should be naturally occurring. 
I'm not sure if I completely agree, agree with this, because why couldn't you study, for example, a TV series, a piece of literature, you can still capture politeness and impoliteness in these, these genres, and it's very difficult how we define naturally occurring. So I would say that if you don't use elicited data, you are fine, because the boundaries of naturally occurring are quite vague, like a soap opera or in India, typically a Bollywood film, which contains a lot of, lot of aggressions, quite fun. I've seen a few Bollywood films in the airplane, and I've seen enjoyed it, enjoyed them. So for example, these films are naturally occurring in a sense that they are pro art products, which I, as a watcher, will evaluate. So from my perspective, of course they are designed, but in a sense they are naturally occurring. It's so very difficult to, to claim what is the boundary of, of, of this term. Uh, so here is the third wave of politeness research. Third wave people say that research has no ultimate state. So I believe that, because in second wave, if you read Mills, for example, and Watts, they make some arguments that it is impossible, I think it was Watts, yes, it, you mentioned yesterday, right? So Watts said that there is no an ultimate theory of politeness, there can be. I think it's a stupid argument. I, I mean, I, I know no with Richard, and he's a nice person. But basically, the, uh, his idea is that uh, we have reached the upper limit of what can, we, can, we, we, we could have done, and the field cannot move any further. I would say that this is a very ambitious claim. You can always move the field further, and there might be um, series like the survey stuff, which will be able to capture politeness, although these series themselves might become old as well. So I always tell my PhD students, for example, not to Many of my PhD students are very deferential. They say that, oh, Professor Kalle, I use your book as my absolute uh, framework. I always tell them not to. Hey, you are not supposed just to repeat knowledge. You should have your own knowledge. And even more importantly, my series get old. People's series get old. They continuously update them, of course, but there is no ultimate series. Really. And we need to return to what Pran and Levinson was doing. But instead of talking about universality, we just talk about micro level. And hopefully this way we will be able to capture politeness and impoliteness across language and culture and you know, say something, be able to say something, give something to our students as well. But I think this is it really. Um, oh, I still have slides about third wave. Okay, sorry. I stop for a moment. Do you have any question? Feel free. Yeah, go. I have something about this uh, naturally occurring data. Say, for example, when we uh, take uh, data from uh, soap operas or movies, uh, I think I, I mean, it's not my idea, but I've read somewhere uh, in some of the papers that, uh, especially with aggression studies, they may not be, the acted data may not be really useful because people generally, the actors don't lose control was the way a naturally occurring So we may, uh, I mean, we may lose some, some of the information that we are taking. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, we talked a lot about this research, and I guess, I mean, you are you were really nice in your research and very fair because you admitted that there are possible limitations on, on availability of data. So, you know, if, if you, you just need to admit defeat, so you need to acknowledge that, yeah. And this is what you are doing, so I think your approach is absolutely fair. I wouldn't, I would go, I mean, well, we, in this project, will sooner or later, if we get lots of money, a bigger project, we will be able to collect real data, because then you go to ATM machines, cash machines, you may might be able to see real aggression. But in order to do this, you need lots of, lots of, of support. So what can you do? I, I think it's, it's absolutely fair that you admit this, and that's it. So. I appreciate that a soap opera can ever be pre-designed, but I would also add that in a soap opera you want to sound authentic, otherwise people at home won't watch you, right? I mean, for example, there is the guy who slaps the girlfriend, who slaps her. It needs to look like real aggression, otherwise people would laugh. These are professional actors, of course, but still, there is a sense of and there's a clue, you know, there are clues in it regarding aggression. 
So you can you, you shouldn't say that they are completely no good either. They have their limitations, that is true. Uh, and also we need to keep bear in mind that well some history, it's very far from our uh, 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 workshop today. But you know what historical pragmatics is the study of historical text. It's a very important area within pragmatics. Now, historian, historical pragmaticians like Andreas Juke, he's a good example, always says that any text you study is equally important and useful. You just need to explain why and how you use this text. But there is no such a thing as imperfect text. And I think this is, this is an important claim. So yeah, at this stage, I wouldn't. Yeah, wouldn't worry. Any other question? Feel free. It's I mean, if you, if you don't, don't worry either, I mean, you don't have to ask questions, I just stop for a moment. But if no, I just go on a little bit further, and meanwhile, if anything occurs, feel free to stop me. So I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the third wave of politeness research. Uh, in particular, in my book with Michael Ho, but it's not only my book, we have talked a lot about the idea of social practice. Because we believe that, well, if you want to talk about the macro level, of politeness and impoliteness, you may not be able to study forms, for example, because forms can always be idiosyncratic or used in idiosyncratic <coughs> ways. But why don't we study recurrent forms, recurrent practices of language use? And if we study these, we will see that these social practices um, can help us to capture politeness on a macro level. So, for example, the social practice of attacking people cash machines, that's a typical social practice. It's something much broader than utterance, it's a social practice. However, yesterday when I was talking about aggression, and now we go back to aggression, I was talking about typical forms. I don't, unfortunately, I don't know nothing about Hindi, but in English, so in English, there are typical forms like, hey mate, do you have light? Give me light, and that means that oh, we are in trouble, it might be a threat, or hey, Sir, you look there and he punches you in the face. That's a typical uh, form which, attack, which, which precedes attack. So these are behavioral forms in terms, and in terms of social practice. There's a particular social practice of attack at cash machines, say, which, which work uh, in relatively identical ways. Now, the notion of social practice are highly pertinent to understand the formation of relationships across cultures, and also to capture things like aggressive behavior. Because in aggressive behavior, I mean, in most of the time in my previous research, I used to talk about the formation of interpersonal relationships because it's, it's, it's in my field. So, you know, politeness researchers always end up in, in talking about relationships. The thing is, however, that in certain areas, like in a project on, on aggression, the relationship itself is not so much interesting rather than the outcome of the conversation. Because, you know, um, of course, attacking somebody forms a certain relationship with the victim, but it's not so important than the effect of the attack or the threat itself. And studying social practices helps us to capture this phenomenon as well. Uh, a basic claim in survey politeness research, and not just my stuff, but all my colleagues, I think, agree, is that language use operates beyond the boundaries of language. So we very rarely use this notion of linguistic politeness or impoliteness research. In most of the cases, we, are, we describe ourselves as politeness and impoliteness research. I study facial expressions and gestures an awful lot. And if this project becomes serious and we get serious funding, we will have to coordinate our voice recognition system with CCTV cameras because it can be, such a system can't be isolated, right? Because many things which happen, so language is just one of the many things uh, that take place in the formation of interpersonal relationships. Also, well, um, studying social practice provides traits about culture, community, and other forms of cultural behavior. Well, I don't go into this example, but in the so example of social practice taken from my colleague Michael Hope's study is a lovely example. It's, it, 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 it is, uh, you know, Snoopy. 
Charlie Brown. Uh, basically, Charlie Brown say, uh, the girl says, you have a, a Lucy, sorry, the name is Lucy. So Lucy says, you have a tendency to talk loud that you get excited. Don't you, Charlie Brown? Why do you suppose you do this? Charlie Brown turns back saying, I don't know. No one has ever been rude enough to tell me about it before. And then Lucy stays here saying that the critical people are criticized. So what's happening here? What's the problem here? Basically, is, does Lucy criticize Charlie Brown? She does. Does she perform a speech act of criticism? No. If you study the traditional units of analysis, you know, there is no speech act of criticism here. She just speaks naturally. However, her kind of natural speak, speech implies that she is critical because there's a social practice of talking loudly. It's not a nice thing in, in West Europe and America. I disagree with this, by the way, because in Hungary, Hungarian culture, we talk an awful lot, very loud, just like our Indian friends. So I, I, I don't have any problem with talking loud myself. Uh, I told Ritesh that I often find myself in in meetings at the UK to be the loudest person, like, ah, I, love that. I laugh like this, everybody's like, you know. But again, in certain cultures, there's, a, there's an implication that you, you are not supposed to be loud. And this implication is here, so there's a social practice behind the words. A social, so criticism operates simply because there is a social practice that talking loud is not nice. Does this make sense? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an alternative unit of analysis. Now, social practices come into existence through the moral order. I go back again morality. Yesterday, I was talking an awful lot about morality, and I'm going to digest, sort of, reach you this notion with you again and again. It's important. An American researcher, Harold Garfinkel, you know his name, hopefully. He was a sociologist and a photographer. Um, He's he argued basically that if you study moral order, we can tease out what is referred to as the seen but unnoticed element of language. So as a lot of things we perceive but not really notice in, in, in language. So we organize information according to sort of how we, we are supposed to organize them, according to moral orders. Say for example, in Charlie Brown's case, what Lucy says is not nice, it's a form of criticism, so it violates the kind of order of things. And this is why Charlie Brown is so upset, right? So we evaluate things on the basis of whether they should be said or they should not be said. Now let me go back to our project again. Obviously, I, yesterday I was talking about the time and space. So when are we interested in utterances? We are interested in utterances if they take place in a time and a place where they should not take place. We don't suppose them to take place. Say, somebody at midnight asks fire from you. Give me light, the light please, mate. It's really dangerous and threatening because it just shouldn't be there. It's not the time and place where it should happen, right? So basically, it violates the order, the moral order of things. And as such, it's also moral or immoral in a popular sense. It's not nice to be asked this question there and then. So this is why it's so evidently important in, in our project as well. Whatever we study uh, is related to the notions of morality and, and moral order. To show this scene and uh, I'm not noticing, Garfinkel has a very nice example. When somebody asks, how are you? How am I? In regard to what? My health, my finances, my school, work, my peace of mind, my that it becomes straight in the face and losing control. Look, I was just trying to be polite. Frankly, I don't give a damn how you are. In some cultures, typically English speaking cultures, people ask, How are you? How are you? They don't care about it. That the moral order of things. Going into details is not nice. I actually found it quite disturbing when I moved to the UK. Because in Hungarian culture, if we ask about the other, we are really interested. I want to know about you, this is why I'm asking, otherwise I wouldn't ask. It's not the same in, in English speaking, in many English speaking countries. Maybe not in India, I mean, I imagine that the Indians care about the other because it's a chatty and cheerful. 
uh, culture, but in some in, in, in the North, North America, for example, people say, oh, how do you, how are you, how are you, is it just pass through? So again, there's a moral rule there. This is what should happen. You say, how are you, how are you? I say, honey, thanks, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? If I violate this order, this is an unseen order. We don't see this order unless we violate it. But once we violate it, it becomes extremely visible. So that's the idea. Well, yeah, so the thing is that we can talk about idiosyncratic behavior. Idiosyncratic behavior, which was picked up by Richard Watts and Sarves and others, is of course important. That's the basis of, of discursive stuff. But you know, when you study moral order and recurrent forms of behavior, it has to get beyond this thing, to study the culture element as well. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes to the idea of social practice, you can also start to think about ideas like time and space. I'm quite eager about using these notions, because for example yesterday, we were talking about bias threat is threat. And I told you that most of the threats, at least those threats we are interested to study, are not, are, are not threatening on the surface level. Again, for example, I told you this example of, of Ray. Usually it begins as guys making make compliments to the victim, right? So it's seemingly very harmless, but it's not in the proper time and place. It shouldn't happen there and then. This is why it's extremely threatening. Now, this notion of time and place opens up different understandings of practices. Like, for example, some interactions we can argue are emergent. They happen for the third, first time. Like, some others are recurrent. They come back and they come back again and again. For example, that I will skip this. Video. Oh, yeah. I think I better stop because it's been quite a long session. I will keep the remaining classes a bit shorter. But I, it's good as we could overview the field. I think it will help you to position your research within these areas. It's, ex it's obvious that what we are doing in this project is typically survey stuff. And this is why I told to Ritesh that don't. When he came to me two years ago, we had a very joking or very humorous conversation in my office in England. He came to me that I want to write polite. He was very enthusiastic. I want to write a politeness series. And I told him I'm not interested in politeness series. But I'm very much interested in practice. And when I realized that he's an expert of computer, I was like, wow, 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 now I'm interested in this. <laughs> because, um, again, if you do third wave CV, it's heavily data driven, exactly because we are not so much interested in idiosyncratic behavior, it's rather social practices and secret forms of behavior. This is why it's fantastic, I think, what we are doing in this project. But this is heavily data loaded. So, what you guys are doing is very heavily data driven. And this is it now. Any questions? You don't have to again, don't feel obliged. But don't feel face threatened either. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up with it. Question actually, uh, I want you to uh, elaborate a bit more on this face and politeness. You said that they are different phenomena, but more often than not, we see them uh, very closely tied. So, if you can speak a bit more about that, uh, giving me a bit more uh, detail that how do you uh, disentangle both? Uh, so just, 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 I'm sorry. Just double checking if I'm if I understood your question correctly. So you, you ask about space and time, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and space and oh, face and politeness. Apologies. Yeah. yeah well, um, the thing is that well, comparing face. So people often talk about politeness and face, but it's like talking about an apple and a pear. It's a different thing. Politeness is something which comes into existence so we, by, by using the language, right? But face is something which is inside already. It's part of your broader identity. Of course, face is being 
transformed all the time. And in this respect, it's worth studying. There are a few very interesting series like Helen Spencer Otis, Rapport Management series, and Robert Arendelle's uh, face series. So they are all very important approaches to face. The basic idea is that face is, is something much broader. So you can't, I mean, face can be strengthened in many ways, and these ways are not necessarily polite or impolite. Also, face can be maintained in many ways, and these ways are not necessarily polite or impolite in a narrower sense. So I would just say that, that if, if you study politeness, you basically study a language phenomenon, or a multimodal phenomenon in interaction. If you study face, I guess, you study, I, I mean, my colleagues like, uh, Bob Aron they have a debate with this. Um, I hope I don't say anything rubbish. I'm not a faith expert myself. But they would say, I believe, that faith is just with you all the time. And also, it's a, although it's an interactional phenomenon, because it comes into existence as you connect with others, it's not necessarily a linguistic phenomenon, right? But another thing related to that, because the example that we shared about that uh, uh, black guy who, the kid, uh, yeah. uh, he, he said that uh, I'm marked out as a welfare uh, guy because okay. uh, the, the, the last sentence probably that I'm marked out as a uh, on welfare. So, so you said that his face is under threat because he's probably not wearing as good clothes as other are wearing. Uh, so uh, here I also see a sort of link between the identity and the face. Do you also see it uh, in this relation and then uh, then separate uh, politeness and face and you see more uh, the phenomena of force, uh, face more related to identity? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, I would use more. I have no idea about this because um, I think it would be a very ambitious claim. But it's very true that identity they, plays an important role here. Identity and face have, have strange relationships. And uh, various face scholars have various claims about this thing. I, myself, I'm more interested in identity than face itself. Although, as you, have, as you point out absolutely rightly here, well, it's not the child's face which is threatened. The child doesn't care about his face. He threatens his, his, his mother's face because he knows that if her, his, his mother will feel that her face is being threatened, she will buy new clothes for him, right? That's the idea. So it's not that the child's face is being under threat here. This is why politeness is not here. But you're right, identity, suppose that it is black identity here, is being used as a discursive interactional resource here. So yeah, absolutely. Anything, any other question? Thank you. Thanks. Very